All right. Um, thank you for joining us. Okay. Uh, uh, I want to introduce um, Joanne Kim, uh, where we're going to be talking about navigating cultural appropriation in the age of remix. And um, we first met uh, a few years ago uh, when um, he invited me to, uh, I think it was like a new culture summit or future culture summit. And um, uh, we had uh, a number of interesting discussions that I will remember. Uh, and uh, recently I reconnected over like Messenger and we we're talking about different things and uh, this topic like showed up uh, and given that uh, I've been always uh, interested in um, this method that he's been using uh, called method sampling to create his own music, uh, I thought that uh, it might be an interesting discussion uh, to host live uh, and given that the music that he creates is actually based on like borrowing different like methods from um, other styles, uh, I thought uh, he'd have something to say about that uh, that might be interesting to discuss together. So um, welcome, uh, and um, maybe you can give us a bit of background on how you got inspired to start with uh, this method. You know? Yeah, first of all, I just want to check on a housekeeping item. I, I seem like you're lagging a little bit. Can you see me and can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in my end, you're just like moving very slow and I, not talking, and then you're not <laughs> moving really. I, I can uh, actually so, see you and hear you fine, so um, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, good, good, good. So, um, so the way I started this project was um, it was because I was feeling sort of um, disillusioned on the classical uh, music, in in particular new music, which is just like a you know there is this idea that music should be um, new music language should be created and then those, you know, these avant-garde artists who are basically prescribed to do certain kinds of things, in my opinion, that kind of defeats the, you know, uh, meaning of avant-garde, but there is an idea of, you know, pushing the musical language forward, and that should be disseminated to the public, and that's how we are, you know, going forward. So I always felt that that was not working because simply, since they started that, Kind of revolution at the end of uh, were at the end of 19th century and early 20th century when everything began this way, so that um, the whole like modern postmodern sort of idea of like breaking the existing structure, uh, it really didn't work. It didn't translate to the mass culture. So if that if, if it were the case, then it will be hearing Britney Spears singing all this crazy tonal, you know, uh, top tone music, but never happened, right? So, and I felt that um, as, a, as a Korean person, what I was interested in about classical music was that simply it was actually new, and not only was it new, uh, because pop music is also new for me too, since that, you know, in, in Korea, pop music, anything that it has to do with non-Korean thing for me was very exotic and new. And I need to actually learn how they actually come up with this kind of structures. So compared to pop music, music for me was more rigorous. It was more new. But then once I came here, I realized there's, it's an old music. And not only that, there, there's a sort of uh, prescribed way or biased way or or like, you know, uh, what, how, how would you call it? Um, so dogmatic way of doing being an artist. So I re I rejected that because it was simply I wanted to be, you know, involved in something new and creating something new. And when I realized it wasn't actually new, I I rejected. It. So that's how I started it. And I did a piece uh, for a composition department concert at uh, San Francisco Conservatory of Music while I was doing my master's. 
and I included a an MC uh, shape almost like a sausage because I think that not only there is um, sort of um, you know the aesthetic doesn't match, but there is also this underlying sort of uh, current like. Uh, in America, that I always say this in America, there are three things that I don't understand. To give you the perspective, I mean, I'm sorry, to go a little bit back, so to 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 give you an idea of who I am, is that I grew up in Korea until I was 20 years old. So when I came here, I, I was formed as a Korean person. So three things that I don't get in America are football, racism, and musicals, okay? So <laughs> these things are really weird to me. It's a very American phenomena. And I think, you know, the second category of racism probably had to do with something, had, had something to do with the fact that they didn't like, you know, black MC coming in into this European sort of thing and, um, you know, basically crashing the party. And what happened there, which I was fully expecting, uh, was that the teachers got upset. What is he doing? What do you think he's doing? This is crazy. Why? Why is he? Why is this black guy here rapping like this nonsense stuff? And then the second thing that I didn't really expect was that there was a huge write-up on full page write-up on Oakland Tribune, which is a, a respected newspaper at the time. It folded just like a lot of uh, uh, legacy media uh, that are folding. Um, but and then the audience loved it. So my MC suggested that I write an album with him. So next six months, I, write, I, I you know, I spent time writing this stuff that I didn't even know what, what I was doing. So, um, and then afterwards, I had to seriously think about um, what I have done and got into hip hop that way. Because I, I'm gonna be honest, I did not like hip hop, I didn't understand it. And, you know, I just had, gotten there to the country pretty uh, pretty not too long ago at that at that point. So there's a lot of slight linguistic barrier because also like the way they rhyme is very unique, right? So uh, and I didn't grow up with it. So it was very foreign, very weird situation. But what I did uh, was to actually give repertoire of hip hop as much time as I have given uh, any uh, serious piece of modern music, because what happens usually is that modern music, um, you know, is taken seriously, therefore, even if you don't like it, you are kind of like encouraged to keep listen, like encouraged to listen to it over and over again until you actually have either identified it or, um, you know, um, uh, what is the word? Um, you know, identify why you like it. So I did the same thing. And, you know, I left, listened to hip hop and I kept going into these like repertoires that are like so uh, revered as a classic hip hop tracks, right? So, and it was when I actually encountered NWA in particular, I don't know whether I can swear here, at the police, um, that piece liberated me in, in a way because I felt like it wasn't necessarily, or it wasn't at all about like clever structure that these composers come up with. It wasn't, it wasn't the newness of something. It was actually all about having the profound necessity to express. And then when that happened, um, it just broke open all these sort of uh, structures to, to come. So, the, the actual necessity is first, and then structure came later. So I kind of understood. I, I, mean, I, I literally felt like I was dipped into the river of hip hop, and then I was born, and then I was totally free. So that's how I began. Uh, and then we can talk about meta sampling a little later. But um, but that's that's how I began this whole journey. I see. Um, a I... For some reason, like I can't see myself on the on the screen, but uh, I actually did hear everything you said. And in some ways, like uh, you know, uh, your voice is more important than my face, <laughs> so I don't care. Uh, well, um, uh, I think that um, uh, 
I guess one question I want to ask to now that you give us that background with respect to like the topic that's um, that's on the title is in that journey that you had, like did this topic like ever come up? Uh, like in, in conversation or like discussions mm. of one among like the artists that you were collaborating and, and two, like maybe, you know, among like the audience. Well, I think that um, with, with the people that we collaborated never because, you know, it's as much of their work that is coming in because I'm not writing any rhymes. I, I pick a topic and then it's a general topic. And a lot of times I write the music first, which is how hip hop music is done. It's not like, you know, they come together to the uh, producer's house and they like listen to it and then like, oh, next bar should be this way. No, they actually do a lot of trusting. So producers generally write the uh, tracks first and then they send a bunch of tracks to MCs and then the MCs pick what they like, right? So. I mean, the only difference would be I would actually, you know, write out this stuff and then send me a mock up. Uh, they don't have, you know, many, many tricks to choose from. I mean, but then all the writing is done by them, so by our MCs. Uh, and uh, they embody the topic and then they actually write it out what they um, feel and what they need to express. So, no, not at all from the, um, from the art artists that we come uh, collaborate but sometimes you know people thought that you know what is this hip-hop are you trying to uh, you know make hip-hop more classical or what are you doing i mean it's more it ironically it's more from the hip-hop side that you got pushed back personally but not from the audience a lot generally the audience really like it but i think that any time when there's a purist like the real hip-hop or like what is really classical music when you get into that kind of conversation, you always have these type of people that are like really bug kill and lame and generally they don't actually, you know, they actually tend to, uh, what is the word, um, protect. And they tend to protect what has already been done. They are, they're never the people that actually break them. I mean, they're, do something new because in order for you to do something new, you've got to break something, break something that is. I see. Um, so uh, th this actually did come up in uh, when I was reading about this topic. Uh, it seems like they had like uh, two different um, two different ways by which like the topic comes up. Uh, one of them basically has to do with when uh, something is taken out of context uh, and there's um, if we were to give them basically like titles, uh, one would have, to, would have to do with like property and the other one would have to do with sanctity. So, you know, when you take something that belongs to another culture and you start using it in a way that wasn't originally intended by that culture and you do it in a disrespectful way, then it seems like you're touching upon the sanctity aspect, like especially when you're doing it like with religious symbols or all sorts of like uh, things that are held to be very valuable by the original culture. And, and then the other aspect that comes up has to do with yeah. uh, the property aspect where, you know, especially when there's a part differential between the person who's like, you know, taking or like borrowing or using basically the cultural elements and the person who originated them or the culture that originated them. Uh, and there isn't in some way um, some sort of other attribution or enumeration um, involved in that like act. One of the things that I actually liked is that the, at the end of your video, um, I, I remember the, the one that you're talking about, like method sampling. Um, there was a little detail that I noticed that I liked where, you know, I think the last sort of like frame is borrow, create, repeat method sampling with EMN. And the, the thing that I wanted to like, you know, highlight is, you know, the word borrow, which presupposes and when you borrow something, you know, you uh, are supposed to like, you know, return it in a way. So I guess like my question would be, um, what is it that, you know, you uh, do as a band to kind of like uh, return or honor like the places from which you method sample? Like, you know, are, do you have any practices? Is that something that comes up in the conversation? Um, yeah, I was curious because uh, the way you ended that 
clip about method sampling, there was this word borrow. So, you know, when you borrow something, you return it, right? So I, I was wondering, what is that give and take that happens when you, you know, borrow different methods uh, or sample different methods? Uh, can you speak to, to that about a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that I, I understand the remuneration part really well, because I think that happened to African-Americans here or people of color in general, but specifically African-Americans regarding musical uh, sort of inspiration or what they did, you know, this is a prime example. And then all these like British pop bands, they got ideas from blues and you know, R&B acts here, right? So that side of music industry has been exploited like that to begin with. And I think that it's not um, an exception because it was, you're talking about power dynamics, right? You're talking about power dynamics, I totally get it. As for the sanctity uh, element, um, and then I'm gonna go, go to your question. Sanctity element, I don't know whether I totally am concerned about that because, okay, unless I'm like actually, I don't know. I mean, there's always taboo things in a culture. Like the Western people think that that's there's no taboo, but you can't really joke about Holocaust or something like that, right? So, you know, in 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 Muslim world, you can't really like uh, depict uh, the image of prophet, blah 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 blah. But there's there's different kind of taboos that we believe that is, you know, really horrible based on the history, you know, history and how we grew up and what does that mean? So, but in terms of sanctity now, how things are really changing is that you start getting attached to that idea, then you can't really see the principle behind it. Because there's one thing to actually have, I don't know, have a dread, dreadlocks, and you have like grill on, and then you're claiming yourself as a hip hop person, even though you are nothing like it at all, which is, in my opinion, a good cosmetic sort of decision, right? So, so in, in some ways, in that sense, appropriation is almost like, you know, people can wear this sort of month, like flame of the month, and then they can still maintain their privilege, and they, they are, they're this like, you know, majority white culture that's like just stocking up all the uh, proletariat, you know, a power, and then, you know, the lower end of the society is just like Jews, and they just, you know, spit it out and go to the next one. Like next one, it might be I don't know some Japanese samurai, whatever. So, I I think that if that that's not what we're doing. Because what we are doing is actually really going deeper into the principle because I think cultural things that are on the surface is almost like whatever because it's like decomposing. There's a lot of messy stuff there. But if you're thinking about you know, ancestors of bones, the flesh is already gone, but you can still use the bones, right? So, and that's going to last much longer. And then based on that, you can build something, right? So I feel like we are always, we, our focus always has been um, like focusing on deeper things. Like for instance, we don't use classical instruments ironically what does that mean? Meaning that we would actually use classical techniques to, to begin with. And not only that, none of our players are just okay players. They are generally uh, substitutes for really established ensembles, such as a ballet, a substance. So these people are there to make music. And then they're, they're doing, they're going on an adventure with me because I, they trust me, they trust my writing and they are trying to make this music that they haven't done before. So obviously from that point on, it's not like we let them wear bikinis and then just play the violin on, I don't know, backbeat. This is not what we're doing. And the other thing is that what we are interested in is not necessarily coming, bringing things together, but it's more like, how do we actually make new things? Um, to actually explain that further, I think a good way to actually explain it because this we're talking about America. Generally, when we're talking about appropriation. Don't even talk about it outside of the, this country. I mean, it's because this 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 frame is also also being 
exported to other countries. But I mean, yes, I, I totally concede that there are serious, uh, you know, colonial sort of issues uh, here, and we are truly. I mean, it's, it's in our mission statement that we, we are tr truly trying to achieve the decolonization of thought. And uh, but I digress. But we're really focusing on going to something new. When Columbus arrived to America, he thought that he was going to India. It was wrong, right? And not only that, when the Indians or the, the natives at the time came out to see Columbus's ship, which was a large uh, structure, they couldn't see it. They didn't have any frame of it. So at some point, we are, what we are doing is to actually go to a few, and at, at the same time, we're also bringing in new kind of frame so people are not seeing it right now. And I had experienced that by writing this music in the beginning. And, and in general, my strategy was always the classical technique alone because I was good at it and I spent a lot of money and time to learn it. So I thought I could actually mimic hip hop tracks, right? But I, I, I thought I could recreate hip hop music. And what I, when I did, what I created was not hip hop at all. Why? Because no hip hop piece is more than like eight minutes long. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, like four or five minutes long. And aside from that, there is like, there's gonna be interlude that is four minutes long and then it going, going into different kind of time signatures and having all these different things that there, which is normal for classical music, but won't happen in, in hip hop music. Then where are we now? Like are we really in hip hop field or are we in classical? Obviously not, you know, a different point. But my teachers thought that we're, we're not in classical music. And how did the conductor, uh, a quarter of mine, who's 40% classical music, said, okay, that's fine, but who cares? I never cared about that because of me not caring about sanctity, because who cares about all this stuff? Like, why do you care about that? Because, you know, at the end of the day, all these cultural reasons for taboos come out of habits. It's customs and habits. We did it, there was a reason for it, but then it remained. Maybe it's not so much relevant anymore. I'm not saying everything is like that, but generally the way I approach culture is something to be changed because Things are changing, especially now that history has accelerated during the pandemic. I mean, think about like six months ago or like two years ago. Can you imagine if most people would be sitting at home, working at home? We wouldn't be sitting at all, right? So well, it's accelerating right now. And we need to actually create new frames to actually match with the development of technology and the way we will be. And in that juncture, we actually need new structures. But then if you're thinking about sanctity, you're just simply gonna reject certain kind of changes, then I would you know, comfortably say you're the enemy of ensemble with me. <laughs> because we want to change. I did read uh, this, uh, this interesting like um, paragraph in, in the wiki for like cultural appropriation, uh, where it basically says that, uh, it's actually a deeply conservative like notion, uh, despite it having progressive roots that like first seeks to preserve in formidable height like the content of an established culture, and second tries to prevent others from interacting with that culture. So because you know culture is like a living thing. So you know when you're trying to um, say, well, you know this is appropriation that presupposes that you know you are cutting it out of the living context that it is um, that exists on uh, and you are preventing people who are not part of the culture to be able to speak to it interact with it and so forth even though i have to say that you know there there is something to be said about you know the way that people like approach different cultures so 
I understand that argument, uh, like, but I don't think that the people who are kind of clamoring or like pointing that out really want their culture to kind of like be static and and like not change. Even though sometimes like this may be the result uh, if yeah. they are yeah. tricked about it. Uh, I think that the main two things that like bother uh, the people who do make that charge has to do with like disrespect from the people who are like you know using elements of a certain culture. And um, as I said earlier, sometimes like switching the use or the meanings around certain like aspects to such a point where it's almost like the opposite of what it was originally intended for. So that's what that's where the that's why the, the yeah. idea of like, you know the sanctity of certain things. Uh, like for example, like if we were starting to kind of like you know a drawing like different. Uh, I think you mentioned it, like, you know, different cartoons of, like, of, like, Mohammed, like, you know, this is something, like, very, like, you know, uh, different from what a, a Muslim essentially would think about, uh, like, you know, the, in, in some, like, you no, know, in some places, like, that's, uh, that's not really something uh, to laugh about, uh, and yet, like, you know, you saw this, like, massive thing that had happened, like, you know, with the Charlie Hebdo magazines, where, you know, they were, like, you know, openly, like, you know, doing that, and I think that, you know, it's it's easy if you're like from the West to kind of like, you know, dig in your heels of like free speech and just go about and start doing stuff like that. But I think sometimes this idea of like cultural sens insensitivity um, comes to like lend some sort of weight uh, around this notion, especially when, you know, especially when like it's uncalled for. Right. Uh, so um, I, I understand where where these things are coming from, uh, but I think that like with your method sampling uh, idea, um, in some ways it's, it's almost as if you're trying to honor and appreciate what it is you're like you know finding by reusing it and making something beautiful out of it. Um, there's no sort of like intention to kind of like disrespect what you're like borrowing. Uh, so uh, I think no, that not at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of like what separates, uh, like you know, method sampling from from something uh, else. Uh, and um, uh, I have se I've been your I've seen your music, right? It's beautiful. Uh, I've seen like you know how the and it's actually just not only music. I mean, in the performance that I witnessed, um, it was obviously like you know music and hip hop, but there was also like dance. Right. So there were like multiple like elements like on the stage uh, that created like a, a novel experience. And uh, if if we were too strict around like, you know, what we can borrow from other cultures, like that experience wouldn't have been possible. Right. So um, it's it's like one thing to like you know, look at the intentions. Uh, and it's another one basically to look at specific instantiations of somebody who's mixing and matching things. Um, and. Like, you know, being able to make that distinction, I think, will be able to uh, help different artists, like, easily in some way, like, navigate um, that, uh, that term without, without necessarily any sort of, like, charges or, like, disrespect. Um, yeah. I totally agree with you, and I think that you said my answer that I was going to say really beautifully. It's like, how do you honor something that you actually sample you have to make yeah. something beautiful with it right so if you think about even the um hip-hop and uh, hip-hop producers they literally rip off um the um the records that they want to use it from and then they make different pieces right and there's a remuneration part that they actually they pay they pay for this and once they use once they you know actually can see it I mean, I, I want to actually pay for the original sort of source, uh, the right kind of royalty fee, whatever. It's up to them to make something new. And why is that okay, right? So I think, I think if, you, if you think about right now, what we are dealing with is, is a crisis of creativity, crisis of invention. And the reason I say that is that I, I read like a year ago, a very interesting New, York, New Yorker uh, column about age of uh, decadence in that, that 
right now, what we see is constant repetition of pretty much the same thing without much progress. And, and then, you know, basically we have to, in order to feel better in this, you know, uh, recycled crap, we have to, we actually have to have higher virtue. So immediately when you, when you, when you actually see politicians who are by far the worst type of people in my, in my book, simply, it doesn't matter whether you're left or right. Generally, I am more sympathetic to the left type because at least they try to criticize the power or whatever, but even then now, I don't, I'm not so sure about that because I don't think that there's true left anymore. So, hmm. Um, these people, these politicians, politics types, they say that we need to be more ethical by saying, you know, oh, okay, George Floyd died, so I'm going to wrap up 10 o'clock and then kneel without changing any legislation. That means that they have no fucking idea. Can I say, can I say, can I curse you? So, yeah. no idea. And then they just like, uh, they just they just want to keep the power that they have. So in the simple way, we don't have new things anymore. And, and then whenever we have these kind of problems that are occurring of like, okay, there's no, no more new things, you generally dig more, like, you know, dig more trenches and then more entrenched because like, oh, okay, well, we need to, we need to make sure that we're, we're okay. Like our integrity is uh, kind of deserved. But in fact, America in general was really great at innovation. Now we don't do that so much anymore. And we're just, just, it's basically, the success is so great. People think that, oh, the more we have, the better it's gonna be. We are not actually, the, the newer we are, the better we're gonna be. And especially now when you know, uh, the older systems are no more working. So we need to constantly invent. How do you invent? So method sampling is basically uh, um, a way to innovate, right? We're making this documentary. In this documentary, I always, you know, I, I do something like the inverse of what Socrates did. Like Socrates went to Delphi, the Oracle said, good at why this one? And then he's like, no, I'm not. I'm going to see like these famous uh, playwrights and then he realizes the guy's an idiot. He thinks that he knows something, but he actually doesn't know. And then Socrates realizes, oh, okay, well, I guess I am because I, I know I'm an idiot, blah, 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 blah. So the inverse of that is the inquiry that I have is that, okay, you know, I think any meaningful change in innovation that or rendering of new systems will only happen through method sampling. I'm going to meet all these people and I'm going to say, hey, what you're doing is innovative, and then I will find that the sampling, change my mind. So that's, that's what I'm doing in this documentary. So. I see. Uh, so that documentary, uh, is it like, because I mean, I, what I posted in, in our event, uh, like info, like was a little like three minute thing. Is it, is it a bigger one? Yes, it is going to be a 30 minute short documentary which will serve as a um, pilot and um, I'm also writing a book about method sampling so but it will be happening concurrently because I will interview different kind of experts or interesting people that are innovating and then I'm going to show them this method sampling and there there's there's one implication I think that that is actually useful in this you know climate of you know, bifurcated, entrenched, sort of, oh, you're either Trump supporter or like, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, Antifa, right? So you either, you have no, no choices, right? Basically, um, it's, it's, it's that method sampling forces two foreign things, two or more foreign things to come together to create innovation. And often these, two things. In my case, I think that it's disparate stuff like hip hop and classical. A lot of people don't think that that's possible and I'm doing it. And the result is not some sort of buffet where like, you know, there's Chinese food, Indian food, and you know, <laughs> Korean food. It's, you can like pick and choose, which is what multiculturalism of America used to be or is right now. 
this is why we have such a big problem because there's no real sort of sense of universality and there's only sense of individual or siloized people's interests. When you do that, then you know there's no community really because other than oh the fact that oh are you uh what what are you age LGBTQ but you're also black but you're also trans you're also blah 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 it becomes like super narrow right so then when that happens there's no country there's nothing so I think that even bigger than country as humanity for us to come together we need to participate in this uncomfortable experiment of creating something new. And uh, basically, weather sampling, in my opinion, can be a good sort of frame to do those experiences with. I think that uh, in some ways, uh, like, you know, you, you spoke of, uh, like, earlier, like, you know, uh, a few minutes ago, of, of, uh, Okay, so I muted you for a bit because I'm hearing some sounds that are uh, that are like you no know, strange. But I'll unmute you now. Maybe they're gone. Okay, sure. No, they're gone. Um, I'm, I, there's some background noise. I don't know like what it is about. Uh, so I'll mute you till that is over. I think it's some sort of like a or a printer. So I'll do that and and I'll be talking on YouTube uh, in a bit. Right. So, um, yeah, what you said earlier had to do with uh, like this lack of innovation and creativity in some in some uh, respects. Uh, I want to speak a bit to that with like a cultural phenomenon, which is there is a lot of like um, prequels and like sequels, and there, you know Hollywood especially like goes really back to kind of like dig it, dig whatever they can to. Essentially, reestablish an already uh, existing franchise. Uh, I think partially has to do with like marketing reasons. Like you know, they think that oh, like this has an audience uh, and it's already an established audience. Maybe we'll use that and and instead of like creating a new market or a new audience, uh, we'll like capitalize on what we already have in our portfolio. But at the same time, you know, one cannot but like wonder like you know maybe they're running out of ideas. Uh, and there's, we're seeing like this rehash of all these like old movies here and there. And I'm just wondering whether in some ways that's playing it safe uh, uh, by like not engaging in stuff like method sampling, right? Uh, and at the same time, um, you see like in other communities, uh, especially like online, like for example, you've seen like the rise of the memes uh, where people are mixing and matching all sorts of stuff like you know uh, and it's extremely like creative um and of course you know there is uh it's kind of like a wild west because you you know there isn't really a lot of work being done on like attribution and like you no know, honoring like you know the original creators that like went into your meme uh but you know, there is an extraordinary amount of creativity. If you look at those memes, they're like very creative. Now, what's what's interesting, and and I'll mention this because uh, I recently was a part of a uh, of an audience in a presentation where uh, a friend of mine like is uh, coming up with this new uh, platform, new idea or, or called uh, Veeam, um, and I think it's um, spelled. Uh, let me just check. Uh, it's, it's check. Um, it's like V E uh, M E, uh, and what they they are doing, they call themselves like a meta media uh, company. Is they've created a way by which it will be easy using the blockchain of uh, figuring out like who is it that came up with uh, the different components of a certain artistic work and with a very simple sort of like click of a button or not um they'll be able to uh, like easily define what are the terms of like reusing it um, and without 
you having to like look up who it is and all that stuff, you'll be able to very quickly uh, enter into a sort of like seamless transaction of, okay, I'm going to use this and I know which terms I'm going to be like following by doing so. And when um, you, when there's a certain amount of like money that is generated, it kind of like trickles all the way back to the original creator. Uh, and they're working on a technology like to enable that. Uh, so that way, um, the more layers are added to like the creation, uh, everybody gets a cut of what they added. Uh, so it creates like this cascade of like attributions uh, going all the way back to the original creator. Uh, so, so that way you both get attribution, but you also get a cut, uh, but you can actually make it easy for creators and creatives to reuse stuff using the platform. Now, that ties into uh, some ideas that I've heard. Uh, I don't know if you ever like read this book called Who Owns the Future by Jaron Lanier. But he was saying that how like all these social media companies are taking a piece of uh, our content, right? Um, and, you know, they're not paying us anything for it, right? Uh, and he, he made this, this uh, uh, you know, they're saying, yeah, but you're using the platform for free. But of course, like the amount of money they're making, uh, like, you know, is absurd uh, with respect to like what it is that they're giving their users. So he had made that argument that like, if you were to go to uh, like a forest, um, and start cutting trees to make furniture. Uh, there's no one alive today that would think that you can just indiscriminately start cutting whatever forests basically are out there. You know, there's a, some sort of like relationship between like the resource, the forest, and the persons who are cutting it, and the sort of relationship that they have with maybe the country or the community that like you know has uh, some level of stewardship or ownership of the forest. So. Uh, he was saying that you know there are like these digital forests that are made up uh, of the content that we create but because it's a new kind of forest that people are not so accustomed to in the same way that they're accustomed to like physical forests uh, it was a bit of a wild wild west out there and the all these companies started just like you no know, using that content without thinking that they have any sort of like no responsibility to um like somehow include in their new remuneration the very people from which they got uh from which they got the content so in some ways like you know they bought they didn't borrow our content right they just took it uh and therefore the in in some ways like <laughs> i'll kind of like suggest something like strange um maybe not so strange um, they are like appropriating like our identity, uh, selling it to advertisers, uh, and in a way, it's like a digital colonialism of our own identity uh, because they're using all that data um, and they're not remunerating any of the users. Um, and on top of that, especially like you know, nowadays, it, they're also like affecting the very kind of data that we can share. I'm talking about the censorship that's happening all over big data. So in some ways, I like uh, if there is such a thing as digital culture, and if we are digital natives, then they're actually you know culturally appropriating like our culture uh, without actually any sort of remuneration or respect, um, you know, by giving us something back. So I wanted to to hear what you potentially have to uh, say in response to that. So I'll try to unmute you. Hopefully the sound is gone. All right. Um, can you uh, try okay. to speak? Is it okay? Is okay. it gone? Is it gone? Oh, yeah. It's still gone? Yeah. No, no, it's gone. Okay, good. It's gone. So, um, I really like that idea. The, the company Veeam, um, that's really interesting. I don't know if it's going to succeed because, you know, uh, I just saw uh, somebody posting a question. I, you know, somebody doesn't think that it's, uh, it's a, it's possible or uh, a good idea of breaking art down into you know, uh, little components that you can actually, um, you know, uh, sort of say that, okay, I, I took the arm of Michelangelo's design and then I just did this stuff. Um, it, it, incidentally, um, it's just, just a little tangent, but it's similar. So I think what we are doing is slightly different in the sense that 
unless this beam company is actually doing, you know, and actually thinking about the method as opposed to, you know, like meme and other things that actual substance, right? But method sampling is actually, how did you come up with that substance? You're actually asking a, a question that is before that. Okay? So uh, uh, one of our subjects in the documentary is, is this tiny house builder, Abel, and he, he studied shipbuilding. And then, so when he thinks about tiny house, essentially he's doing a um, inversion, inverted ship, inverted ship. So instead of following the normal sort of construction of housing or like you know, buildings, he's thinking about ship, ship, right? inverted ship. So um, going back to the idea of beam and actual like the economy that you can generate, I think this is a great idea because, you know, I, I think there are mixed things that you can sort of identify in terms of generating new things, you would either take literal material like hip hop uh, people, or you could actually think about, um, um, you know, the, um, you could actually think about the method uh, that where, how, how it was generated. So, yeah, I like the idea. And um, I agree with you in terms of the, um, the big data, basically, I think, I think was it Andrew Yang, he, he talked about big data, like it's new oil, right? So we're basically not even, not even appropriated. We are, we are the, the freaking part that they take, right? We're generating it. They're just taking the resources that we're generating. So I think that might be better analogy. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah, I, I definitely like think that uh, the we are part is uh, is uh, is interesting. Um, I mean, I think that you there are platforms out there that um, are starting to think along those lines. So if you look at, for example, like Rally.io, um, and um, like they're trying to essentially find ways to establish what uh, what you would say would amount to sort of like collective ownership of uh, a certain like class of creative assets. Uh, so, you know, you, you're starting to see slowly like uh, the possibility of uh, being able to take the fact that we live, you know, in a digital age uh, and therefore the very platform and the very like way that we interact and create uh, is forcing us to rethink of what it means to like own things and what it means to share things uh, and what are the ways by which mm -hmm. you can actually uh, honor the ones that you, you know you're collaborating with so uh, you know obviously like you know when it comes to like the technology of like blockchain like you know I think that there's gonna be more developments with respect to like DAOs, uh, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations where, uh, you know, we're all part of potentially a DAO. And, and in that DAO, we have like very specific ways by which we sort of like, you know, uh, create and share our creativity with for, with each other and for the public. Um, and, uh, you know, DAOs also like allow you to be able to like vote and change essentially those rules if you want to, or potentially even have like your own special special currency that um, you know people would need to use in order to like buy your own stuff uh, or other applications like that so i think we're not there yet obviously um but at least there seems to be some sort of like movement towards uh taking the fact and acknowledging like the fact that we're digital natives and maybe like building new tools that will allow us to like honor like you know the creative process that is like highly collaborative um, without necessarily like um, using kind of like you know legacy methods uh, given that they're not really appropriate often uh, they're impractical to do like on online uh, and across basically borders right because there's also that you know uh, people collaborating across borders um, make it even harder to, uh, you know, argue around like ownership. Uh, but uh, I'm optimistic. I'm definitely optimistic. Um, the part that I'm not that optimistic on, 
is um, being able to change the quality of discourse and respect uh, among like online citizens. Um, it seems like you no, know, with the changing of the business model of, of the news, where they realize that outrage and causing outrage is actually more profitable because people click more than like other forms of uh, like you know engaging um, has have created like an, an unwarranted almost like polarization uh, between people who like you know live online in a way um, and. I, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure how we'll be able to like reverse that trend, um, given that you know there, there, and that, for example, like you know, has there really been an alternative to Facebook so far? Uh, I wouldn't say so, right? Uh, if there was one, essentially that uh, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there's some. I, I I can mention a few off the top of my of my head, but none of them so far are such that we can like easily just like you know. Uh, jump ship um, and i guess what i'm trying to say is that if we want to live uh in a different environment than the one that is seeing us as a, as a product and is essentially like commodifying us and turning us into packages of attention that they sell to advertisers then we also need to like step up and actually create the very platforms that will have respect uh, of creativity and of different cultures like embedded in the very design of the platforms themselves. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that this is kind of like our time to do that um, because if we don't, we'll just like remain in the same sort of like system that uh, we are already kind of like, you know, rebelling against by, well, never rebelling, at least like, you know, complaining against given all that has been happening with respect to like Facebook. Like it turned, like it, it it started with like a, supposedly the intention to connect people, and it ended up literally like dividing people as much as as much as possible. Uh, so uh, it's not turning out very well. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, have you seen any sort of like um, uh, have you seen any uh, any platforms that like you gives you any optimism, or do you see any any sort of like developments like on the artistic front by different artists with respect to this issue like is there discussions around like your friends who are artists with respect to how do we how do we like create a, a better way of like remunerating each other while respecting uh both ourselves different cultures um and also you know uh not shutting down like uh remixing unnecessarily because there's also that that will create a framework that will make it actually more difficult to remix than than it was before so i don't think anyone wants that um so yeah do you, do you have yeah. any um have you heard of anything well i mean we are i think we're the only sort of you know people have hard time kind of um categorizing us you know, they know that we're not really classical, but they also know that we're not really hip hop. And um, I've seen people who are doing works that are within even the sphere of their own field that's, that's kind of like, at least like pushing it forward. There was a, there was an interesting article, uh, uh, you know, uh, written by Fabio Vigi. He's a, um, I just recently corresponded with him, but he wrote in a philosophical salon about the lockdown, right? So about the lockdown and how it's, it's um, connect. Uh, he, he lay out really convincing evidence how it's connected to the financial markets and then like hyperinflation that, that was about to happen. And then, you know, this conveniently, this virus happened in um, uh, three months after when um, the Fed like created so much money, right? So. But he is Zizek guy, basically. So he, he, he studied uh, Lacan and then using mm. that to sort of um, interpret the world and then diagnose the problem. This is method sampling. So I think I've seen instance of individuals that are doing that. But mm. you know, the, the hope for this documentary is basically identify these individuals and then let them be known. Not only that, we want to connect them and then have some sort of like a collective like that, yeah. that that can actually do stuff. Because I'm telling you, rebellion mm -hmm. is happening. Because um, 
I mean, if you if you think about the media space, they're in free fall. Like even Fox, which I mean, they they still retain because they have their, I don't know, like the Trumpers that really only watch Fox. But then liberals have different kind of layers of choices, right? But then their their viewership is tanking because once you start talking about things that are obviously untrue about certain statistics, I'm not going to go into details of it because. In case if you're sharing this on Facebook, I don't I don't want it to be censored. Um, then you are really messing with people's like trust. Like okay, look, I can't trust you. Whatever you're saying, I am I am suspicious now. And you have uh, people like uh, Crystal and Sagar, uh, Breaking Point, and then uh, yeah. people like the, the Hill Rising. And you know, there's a there's a libertarian guy. There's a guys from Intercept, the Washington Bureau Chief, Ryan Green, and then the the Libertarian uh, Reason Magazine editor guy. And then there's like, a, in the middle, there's this Asian chick that is like always, almost like Q&A type of like, you know, like questioning everything. So that show is doing really well. And you, you, you see that people don't want to listen to legacy media, simply the, the kind of, propaganda that they were able to do because I, I'm not I'm, I have no illusion in the sense that the media is doing what they have been always doing we're just able to identify these things that um, that are just propaganda as propaganda so I think I think there is there is like a reaction against it and you know nature abhors gap so we will find other people that are filling in the need of the market. So I do think I do think that you know what we are doing at EMN is one of those trends because ultimately what we need to do is not necessarily like waiting for this plus giant platform to occur, but like just really, I mean the whole point of blockchain is to actually not have any centralized authority, right? Even yeah. though, even though, let, let's face it, okay, technology will always win, but also the authoritarianism will creep in, you know? I mean, this is, this is how, how things always happen, this tension between, like, liberation versus, like, centralized, you know, control. So I do think that, um, um, you know, uh, there will be some... Control, like you know, uh, the forces that are uh, exerting control over this kind of blockchain type of like decentralized effort, but the answer will come out of bottom up. It will never come from an individual. You know what? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve the judgment on that because even within the movement, there there will be a personality that just kind of do something, but. But definitely, it's not coming from the legacy space at all, because I think you know once even even a, a, a genre that is not even hundred years old, hip hop, say that there is a real hip hop. <laughs> that means that we actually don't have any more creativity in within within the you know traditional sort of path of how we have consumed culture, consumed uh, media, consumed and create different kind of things. So. I think that, you know, uh, crypto space is interesting, although there's a lot of drug money and a lot of shady things going on. But it's, it's in that, in that, because it's still wild, there's more energy there, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. so, that's just I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Uh, there's a there's two things I, w I don't want to forget mentioning. Uh, one of them basically is uh, the distinction between um, like taking the method um, that is used to generate um, something from another like you know cultural style and taking basically the content and playing with that so I want to basically put a little like a um, pause on that but I think that's a like massively like important distinction uh, especially with respect to like cultural appropriation um, and the second thing I'll say is um, you talked about you know the energy that there exists in the crypto space because of like you know the lack of like regulations and all that stuff. Um, I'll just ma mention a reference uh, for those who are so inclined. Uh, there's a great book called uh, Master Switch that talks uh, uh, by Tim Wu 
that talks about you know this thing that he calls the cycle where a new technology comes out all the pirates all the people who love being free like you know try to use it and essentially like uh think that it's gonna be the thing that heals the world and so forth that happened with yeah. radio that happened with like you know uh, television with the internet and then slowly but surely like you know all the different like establishment legacy elite basically uh of whatever country this technology is in come in and start regulating uh all the crazies out i mean crazies according to them all the pirates so with the radio they said okay you know in order for you to transmit in this frequency you have to get a license right uh and then you know of course you don't have to sell the license to people you don't like uh so there's a lot of ways of controlling who broadcasts where um, and in some ways, like he says that you start off by being free and open, and then it ends up becoming like some sort of like weird monopoly. So he feels that we're in that phase right now with the internet. Um, people call it sometimes like the appification of the internet. You see everything through apps that are controlled by big, like, you know, companies like Google or Apple. Uh, so if anybody's interested in that cycle, uh, do check out like Master Switch with Tim Wu. But now that I said my, that piece, I want to go back to what you said with respect to method sampling, which is you guys are saying we're not going to get the products of a certain culture. Uh, we're going to take, uh, take borrow, uh, as you say in your own video, the methods and produce new culture with it, uh, which is very different than taking the cultural artifacts. Because in that way, you're actually not necessarily like, you know, interacting with the results of a certain cultural like methodology. Uh, like you're not taking the actual pieces of content that may have a specific significance, but you're taking the methods themselves and using that to generate something new. So I think that you know, in, in that in that distinction, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, kind of like avoid a lot of the heat. Uh, that like you know somebody talking about cultural appropriation uh, may uh, like you know have to kind of like you know criticize you with because you're not actually taking the products you're taking the method um, and and I think that that that's a, a, something ought to be highlighted um, because yeah. it's different yeah. Yeah. you know it's different um, yeah. yeah so so one thing that you said kind of like make me want to explain one process or like what you've seen right so you've seen a sort of like a proscenium show that had like MCs come out and then there's like a background there's like a uh, um, orchestra there and then you have turf dancers that are dancing uh, movements that are actually mixing ballet and then different kind of contortion different things that yeah. are going on and they actually constantly change and evolve the style so that whole background is actually method sampling of how hip hop emerged via underground parties. So ideally, we our setup would be in somewhere like a black box situation where people are actually walking around with the drinks and, and their hands and then ensembles there, but then there's a cypher circle that is highlighted so that the dancers can dance and then people can participate. So when we actually kind of took that idea and then put it in the proscenium show, we actually ended up creating something new because in meta sampling, the, the idea of reframing is so important because reframing for me in this system is, is basically trying to find, you're, you're trying to bring, I know, you're bringing, not trying to, you're bringing new, new methods and then to insert it in the old field, you don't have one-to-one, -one, there are certain things you can't have one-to-one -one translation. And in doing so, you're actually approximating or sometimes, often misunderstanding it and then changing them alters the whole feel that you're trying to change, right? So, and, and not, that actually makes you go outside of that field. That also makes then the hip hop people never have done that. So therefore we're, we're changing both at the same time. It's a chemical reaction that creates right. like actual change as opposed to a lot of times when people talk about fusion, it just, it's just unclear, right? A lot of, this is why we're not using the, the word hybridization anymore because there's, it's, it one, one is people have been using it in a different context. 
And two, method sampling actually highlights explicitly how these kind of changes can happen in what way, right? So I think that's very important because then there's no misunderstanding. Okay, you can actually uh, take this idea that they're doing and then I can put it in here that, that has never been done before. So then, According to the, uh, the the people who are being sampled from, even then that is exciting. Oh, you're actually using this idea to do your thing? That is interesting. How did you do that? Maybe I'll take your idea, something else, to make my, my thing more interesting. Then we're going to a sort of a spontaneous creation to many, many different places. And I think that this is so much needed now because we have this idea of you know, orthodoxy and authority is even in at some point, like it, it going into the, the realm of science, which is just a process. And there has to be a sort of um, re recovery of the health of the process. So, I mean, I always talk about Greeks a lot because, you know, I think that ultimately what I admired in Greek culture is that it's an infiltrating culture. What I mean by that is that they actually take no, none of their own thing. They, they identify what works. Maybe Rome, Rome, Romans were even more so because they, they wanted to be like Greek, but then they're more open-minded in some, some way. So, so in order to make a, a newer, a better sort of idea, they took in everything that they could find, right? So that is, that is sort of like very, um, um, very much in, in in sympathetic way of what we are doing, right? So, yeah. I, I think, thing. yeah, I, I think that you know, uh, you you gave me, uh, you made you, you made me remember uh, one thing that I wanted to read, and you know, given that we're past the one hour mark, uh, it might actually be a good way to like end this, even though. Uh, it won't necessarily like you know be to the liking of like everyone, uh, but um, you spoke about how they took all those, and it's true by the way. Like you know, if you look at Greek culture, and you know, I'm Greek, um, uh, there's a lot of elements that we took from everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. However, like um, the quote that I'm going to read by Jim Jarmusch um, has a very interesting, basically. Um, sort of like suggestion uh, as a criterion of, of whether you actually uh, honored the material uh, and what is one way of honoring it, right? So, so here's a quote. Uh, he says, uh, nothing is original. Uh, steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. Devour old films, new films, music, books. Paintings, photographs, poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, bridges, street signs, trees, clouds, bodies of water, light and shadows. Select only things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. If you do this, your work and theft will be authentic. Authenticity is invaluable. Originality is non-existent. And don't bother concealing your theory. Celebrate it if you feel like it. In any case, always remember what Jean-Luc Godard said. It's not where you take things from, it's where you take them to. So uh, I think that is a, this is an interesting sort of criterion where, you know, obviously like, you know, the language he uses is to, I think it's on purpose to be provocative or really stealing and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, in your video, you're talking about borrowing. Uh, but um, you know, aside from but it's that, it's the same thing. It's basically the same thing. I think it's the same thing. I think I think it's okay right now. There's so much like fear, like oh, if I say this, I'm a Trump supporter, right? Oh, that kind of stuff. Like I, I think that we need to be more. As long as we have like our direction is not, you know, going to more oppression and more racism, more like sexism, then we have to be able to explain and then express ourselves in an authentic way otherwise you know there won't be anything happening and then the only people that are actually benefiting from are the people that already have power and money big corporations and all these people that got super much more richer 
during this lockdown. But meanwhile, small businesses were losing all their power. So I think we should not be afraid as long as we were, we are able to clarify our our uh, um, position. I think we should say whatever. I think it's very good. Uh, no, I understand like uh, where you where you coming from this. Um, uh, even though I, I I will say that like you no, know, even in the text that we read. He actually kind of like you know explained what he meant like uh, a few sentences down. Uh, but uh, the thing that I wanted to say is that uh, the criterion that he su she's suggesting, right, is that you show your respect uh, of the method or the content that you're gonna be like you know borrowing, like you know reusing by where you take the material, right? Uh, do you take it to a beautiful place, you know? uh in in what way you do so so in in some ways like that could be a, a, a one criterion that um, i haven't necessarily seen in the literature around like cultural appropriation which is like where do you take the material towards right uh, uh it's not just you know uh you know the respect that you pay to the material because often like you know at least from the stuff that I've read, like it's mostly like focused on people who disrespect the material, right? Uh, and I think that yeah. like yeah. Th there's there's one way of respecting material, which is essentially to just reproduce the original intention, which is fine for people who want to do that. But I don't think that's the only way to respect the material. Uh, another way to respect it is to actually take it to places that the original culture or the original basically style uh didn't envision that ended up being beautiful or interesting or innovative uh that's another way of honoring it even though you're changing it so uh i think that's a sort of like positive note uh to kind of like you know close this on if you like hello I remind you that when you when you close your um, uh, your when we end this, uh, please allow it basically to continue like uploading the video because it's saving it in your local drive right now. So um, when you when we end this call, don't close your browser window because it will take some time to upload the raw sort of audio and video to like Melon. So just telling you that before we actually close. And now, uh, if you want to say anything to what I just said before I made this technical sort of like comment, you're free to do so. <laughs> uh. All right. So uh, I think you know you are saying something that is like a prelude to what I've been thinking about. I think that we need to invent new systems, not just system of like making new music, making new you know new car, whatever. It's, it's a system of ideology that could bring about the sense of universality, meaning that, okay, we are actually going together to do something together as humans, as opposed to, you know, our differences, you Greek, you know, person, I'm, I'm a Korean, you're Japanese, all these differences a very, um, it, it, it's just actually are protecting the orthodoxy and then what has been done, the old, and I'm always in the point of the old must be destroyed. So <laughs> in order for us to do that, we need to invent new things. So. <laughs> well, you know, um, if we, if the way by which we create the new thing respects the people who are creating it uh, like equally or in some way, then uh, I think like uh, it, it will work because if we destroy what is, and then only a few people are creating new thing, and suddenly there's new like you know minorities that are created by the way that the new creation uh, happens. Then uh, the people who uh, were part of the old uh, and are now disenfranchised might like you know not be very happy. But you know I, I think that having that common conversation, right, uh, with respect to what kind of sort of like uh, where do we want to end up with when we make that like process of reinvention. Uh, there's yeah. a great uh, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a great uh, part in I don't know if you read the theory of justice by John Rawls, but uh, uh, you know he has an interesting like example. He he says, imagine uh, that you are uh, 
in this space where you have a veil of ignorance with respect to where you're going to end up in this new society. So you don't know where you're going to end up. Uh, uh, you don't you don't know whether you're like you know uh, like black, white, uh, poor, rich. Uh, so if you don't know where you're going to end up, let's say that you're like a disembodied soul that's like you know that's ready to like incarnate in this new world, right? Uh, if you don't know where you're going to end up, how would you design that society? Because clearly, like you know, if you don't know, you might actually end up. If you if you design it an, in a way that's very like you no know, unequal or, or strange, uh, you might actually end up being part of that group that is oppressed. Uh, so you know to take it back on the creative sort of like uh, aspect, uh, maybe the question that we could ask because you know John Rawls did this to create the theory of justice. Uh, but as creators, we would say like if we were to reimagine how we create uh, art. Uh, and culture like moving forward but we wouldn't know like you know where we would end up in this new system what would be some of the ways that we would like design it uh so that um we would feel great irrespective of where we end up right uh so yeah maybe that would be an interesting yeah. exercise yeah yeah that's, that's yeah. interesting i just i mean i am really responding against against something that is orthodoxy that I see it no longer working. And, but there are, there are other people, like the thing is like, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know that we need to create new things, right? So, and I know what I don't like, that's why I don't wanna be that, right? So that's all I'm thinking about. I think that, you know, uh, that the question that you're asking probably would be for people who are philosophers, maybe actually there's a role of philosophy after all nowadays, became very technical with a lot of things. And, um, but for me right now, I know what I have to do. I think that not just showing the, my work, but also identify just different, different people. And I don't have to create it. They can create it. I just have to identify what they're doing as method sampling because it's just a one sort of module to do this one thing, right? Because we don't know where the answer is coming from, but we know it's, it's in the intelligence that is ubiquitous in the bottom, not on the top. Because top, top-down centralized thing has failed us. That's what I know. So. All right, then. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join us. Sorry for like the tech technical mishaps. Um, I think I'm going to be using a different platform at the end of this because uh, I think it's the second time that happened. Uh, uh, but um, uh, I was able to hear like most of, most of the things you said, like 99% of the things you said. But there were some uh, people who were watching this that they were saying that the swan quality is like pretty bad. So, uh, so sorry about that. But um, thank you for the conversation and, and looking forward to like future conversations in the, in the, in the you know, near future. And also uh, looking forward to that documentary that you mentioned. You know? uh, please send it my way uh, and I'll yeah. post it. Yeah. I'll send you. I'll send you one page on the documentary so you can see the subject and then um, the scissor reel that you shared and all the information about it. So. All right, great. Um, have a good day, uh, and uh, don't forget to not close the browser window. <laughs> Let it upload, and then you get closed. Okay. So right. Should I just uh, like say leave or like it says leave X button? So no, I'll end the stream on my and, end, and then let. You I'll end the stream on okay. my end, but just, but just keep the tab like open. That's it, uh, and then it will it will show you that it's uploading, Sounds and good. then it will it will end at some point. Okay, man, good. Bye. Okay, thank you.